And this week we're talking to Gene Picorni, who is the current tuba player for the Chicago Symphony, um, a man who needs no introduction. Um, and uh, I currently study with him um, and uh, I'm sure he has a lot of really good things to say to uh, everybody about what he's been up to um, and uh, how he spends most of his time. Nice. Now, is it possible that, uh, uh, first of all, it doesn't switch over to mine when I talk. So can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll assume that you can hear me and looking at you. So meanwhile, um, Gene Procorni is probably the, uh, the, uh, the most important tuba player playing. In, you know, he's taken a position that Arnold Jacobs held for, for many, many years. It was a, a, a real uh, tribute to longevity and what shoes to fill and boy, did he fill them. So let's invite uh, Gene in at this point. Mighty empty. Is he there? I betcha. Any second. Aha, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> A grand entrance. <clears throat> so, Jared, how did how did you uh, first meet Gene? How did your uh, relationship begin? Oh, Gene, do you remember how we first met? No. You don't. <laughs> Sorry. That's I think okay. memorable, like my first piece of cherry pie a la mode, and when I first got introduced to cheesecake. But I, I don't remember the very first time you and I got together. <laughs> That's okay. I, uh, no. Uh, when, when was it, Jared? Uh, well, I think we. I, I started taking some lessons with you at Ravinia. I think this was maybe like five or six years ago. Um, and I was driving, I was staying with my parents in Windsor over the summer, like before I went to New World Symphony and basically reached out to you and was like, hey, like, can I have some lessons? Um, and I would drive to Chicago, which was four, five hours, have a lesson, then drive back. And mm. after a couple of lessons, I think you were a little concerned because of how much I was driving and that I was maybe falling asleep in some of my lessons. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it was you who was falling asleep? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, it's just the three of us. There's nobody else listening, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, See, now I remember. I remember meeting Chuck for the first time, and that was, uh, well, I. It was a performance in St. Louis, and we had breakfast the next morning. I mean, we we met the, the night, and I remember we met the next morning at breakfast. I mean, we we always remember the other or the other person probably a little bit more and you were talking about tuba tiger rag and i told you about this this uh this buddy of mine on the river who was just this uh he was this butcher who who just played right off his just just the first thing that comes out of his mind it was red lair and mm. you were telling me about tuba tiger rag and the arrangement you did and and i i don't know i may have given you actually a cd of what he did i can't quite yes. remember that, but but well, I, you introduced him to the whole tuba world, as I recall. You you made sure that uh, people became aware of his playing. He was he was a real, uh, just natural, hundred percent natural player, right? Yeah, he had no idea what a tuba was supposed to sound like. I mean, his idea of tuba playing was Pete Fountain, you know, <laughs> the clarinet player. I mean, all he wanted to do was sound like Pete Fountain, and you know, when you li would listen to him play high society that's what he sounded like he you know so. you know uh, gene in the unlikely event that there's anybody that's tuned in that doesn't know everything about you already at least read wikipedia or a chicago symphony biography there was a moment in your career that uh, first of all i think you're from los angeles area is that correct correct yes there was a moment in your career when you uh, dominated three major orchestras. I think you held all three positions at the same time, each vying for your attention, St. Louis, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Well, they didn't quite occur exactly at the same time, but I had, uh, I had taken a leave of absence from 
St. Louis when I joined Chicago in 1989 and then decided I would stay in Chicago in, in 89. And then when the position in Los Angeles opened up, when, when Roger Bobo retired, I took that audition and joined them in 1992, but then, uh, but, but I had taken a leave of absence from, sh from Chicago. So, um, so I had three months to make up my mind whether I wanted to stay in Los Angeles or return to Chicago. So yeah, it was, a, it was kind of a close conjunction there of, I was, I was very lucky to, to have it, but I didn't really, I, well, I, I, I I didn't really want to leave any of my previous orchestras. I mean, I, I auditioned for St. Louis mostly because I had the weekend free um, and they, um, and uh, it was something to do. And the Time Magazine article had just come out uh, with uh, an article about the, about orchestras and they rated, they rated Chicago number one and St. Louis number two. Uh, way above the supposedly the uh, the top five, and I read it. I read the article, and it said they did a lot of Russian music and Eastern European music. And I'm thinking, hmm, Prokofiev. Well, that'll be something new. We don't we don't get around to that stuff in Utah very often. <laughs> so, uh, so I took the audition, and and you know it was like, okay, I wanted to I wanted to take the audition, but I wanted to stick around for the ribs. You know, I mean that was. That was it. I mean, it was the ribs, you know, and, and I got my ribs and came home. And, and then a couple of weeks later, I get this phone call saying, well, I'm in the finals. So, wow. Okay. Well, th th that was a hard nut to crack because I love the Western U.S. I was in Utah at the time. I had just come back from Israel. And, but yeah, I, St. Louis was a wonderful orchestra. I, I always felt good about that place. So. Well, it seems like your your relationships with these orchestras has been really first class. What was the, your background? It, growing up in Los Angeles, you couldn't have been there at a better time. I would bet uh, that Roger Bobo, of course, was reigning fourth. He's just about everybody's hero from that era. So you would have been uh, in touch with Roger. Did you study with Roger, in fact? I did study with Roger. I was in, uh, I took my first lessons when I was in high school. As it turned out, the big connection <clears throat> with him was that I had, uh, was a connection with Jeff Reynolds. Jeff Reynolds was a bass trombone player in the orchestra, and he lived in my same town. The town I actually was living in is Downey. It's about 11 miles southeast of downtown LA. And I got to know Jeff just about the time that he was made uh, uh, bass trombone, bass trombonist of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And I just, I just wanted to emulate Jeff in every single way that I could. So he got me in contact with Roger, found out that Roger wasn't really enamored of teaching that much. And so I made my connection with Tommy Johnson uh, after I had spent some time with uh, Larry Johansson, a, a wonderful trumpet player out in San Bernardino County. Um, but then Tommy Johnson was a real builder. He was a fundamentals type of guy, meat and potatoes and that riff. But, but the recordings of Roger just, just, I mean, that very first album, Roger Bobo plays Galliard, Hindemith, uh, Barat. I mean, I, I just listened to that in the trailer until, you know, I just went through a complete, you know, maybe two or three of those LPs until there was just nothing left. You could actually see right through the through the LPs, there's just not, not enough vinyl left. And I, but that was the sound and I was just, yeah, really taken with, with Tommy Johnson's teaching and his sound. And of course, Roger's sound was just so unique, just convinced well, me you're, that was the sound. You're a few, years, uh, a few years younger than I am, so you may not remember, but for me, uh, when I was in high school, even more than this playing, uh, the mirror phone company had made a uh, publicity photo of Roger and he he looked like a movie star holding a tuba and uh, it just seemed like okay this is worth going for uh, he was an unusual talent and an unusual personality to take on the tuba and really take it in front of uh, major I am his his Carnegie Hall uh, the recital hall solo that just uh, 
that that changed everything for the tuba. I think that was probably a, you know, if, if you'd look for a defining moment, it would be that. And he carried that. Of course, I'm sure you would have known about that very well. Was, right. Was were you uh, were you you were aware when that recital took place at Carnegie Hall? Were you aware at the time? That it was taking place, or did you find out afterwards? Or? I found it afterwards because it happened just before I'd gone to the uh, the uh, Eastman School of Dentist um, Music. Eastman <laughs> School of Dentistry. Yeah, you had a choice: a root canal or long tones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pick the lesser of the two evils. You know, a good thing there wasn't a pandemic in a, in the choice either. <laughs> Is that the truth? But um, every lesson that I had was in relation to Roger. I'd play something and the comment from my teacher at the time at the Eastman, uh, wherever that was, uh, the comment was always, well, Roger would have done this and Roger would have played it this way. And uh, I mentioned that to Roger when I finally got around to meeting him some years later and he, he apologized. And I said, well, was it wasn't your fault. You set such a high standard. And just there we were. And was Chicago, this Bob that you were taking lessons from? That knob, yeah. Okay. A giant trombone player with a huge air capacity playing an instrument a third the size of what we're playing, teaching a small person like me. It was a summer. <laughs> so I'd run back to Chicago every summer and <laughs> repair with Mr. Jacobs. And uh, it was a good combination. What was your relationship with Mr. Jacobs? Uh... I, my first meeting of him was, uh, was on May 13th, 1973. Could you be more specific? <laughs> yeah, what time? <laughs> 8 p.m. Uh, that's when the concert started. <laughs> Actually, it must have been around 8.57 because it was the Mahler Fifth Symphony. Uh, it was just the um, Chicago Symphony happened to be on tour and they were down in San Diego. And my college roommate at the time said, we should go down and hear this orchestra. And I never heard of Mahler. I, I'd heard of the Chicago Symphony and its incredible reputation. So we got into George Russell's uh, um, V-dub and went down there. And uh, the, the tickets were like were $10. I mean, that much? I mean, at the time, you know, it was just like, are you sure this is worth it? You know, so anyway, yeah, how could you how could you afford that? At that uh, I, I know I'd have to give up a couple weeks of pizza, you know, so yeah, or yeah. sell a kidney or something. <laughs> pretty, pretty wild. But anyway, we, you know, heard this and uh, it was pretty incredible. And I, I love Jacob's playing. I thought it was very good. But you know, I'm I, I'll I'd already been to the mountain. I'd heard Tommy Johnson. I'd heard Roger Bobo. I knew what great tuba playing was all about. It was it was good. It was very different than what I had, uh, grew up with in in L.A. Here's this this very buoyant, round uh, sound with a lot of vibrato, and I just wasn't used to that. I was I was hearing I was used to hearing Rogers very assertive, very muscular type of playing and an and, and, and incredible set of overtones that just, that just rang out, that did you just, that just was, was uh, unbelievable, extremely captivating. So, so, um, so yeah, the, the tuba playing was very good. I was extremely impressed with the horn playing, the trumpet playing was very good. And probably the most impressive person on the stage that night in San Diego was Jay Friedman, uh, first mm. trombone. Uh, I hadn't heard trombone playing like that. And uh, it was 1973, like I said. So um, anyway, that was th that was the first connection with, uh, with Arnold Jacobs. And then having gone on a tour with the Utah Symphony after I joined, I ran into Bob Tucci in, uh, in Munich, and he said, "You really got to get together with 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 Arnold Jacobs." And so, I had a week off when I got back to Utah. I got together with Arnold Jacobs, and <clears throat> I'll never forget. After I had managed to spend a week with him, and had probably three or four lessons with him, I came back to Utah. It was a, f 
it was on the break of the first half of rehearsal we had once we got back from Utah. And this violinist who I'd never really spoken to very much, he came up to me and he said, what happened to you? I said, well, what do you mean what happened to me? I, he said, your sound is completely different. And this is a guy who had really hadn't spent much time with. His name was Richard Stout. And I said, I, I don't know. He's, he's, he said, no, no, it, it sounds way different. It's really unbelievable. Uh, are you using a new horn? What, what's going on? And I, I was kind of flabbergasted. And to have someone from the other side of the orchestra come up to me and say, wow, what happened to you? I mean, I knew, all right, I must be on to something here with this uh, with this Jacobs guy. <laughs> so I really started to make some time with Mr. Jacobs, so. And then you inherited his instrument, the famous York whatever, six quarter uh, horn that everybody's tried to copy for years. Yeah, and where most manufacturers would love to see destroyed because it has set such a high standard. It just, you know, it's, Every time we have a we have a, a, a cattle show on stage at Orchestra Hall, we put a bunch of different instruments up there with you know different makes and models and copies of this and that and another thing. Why you know it'll, it'll, it's like a white elephant sale. There's all these instruments lined up across the front of the stage of Orchestra Hall, and and play them down, play the same excerpts and people going to different parts of the hall and, you know, making notes and stuff like that. And then, and then at the end of the evening, so well, well, why don't you go ahead and play the York? And I pick up the York and start to play that. And people go, Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just a, so that's the stand, you know? So, yeah. So what, what is it about the York that, really makes you keep going back to, without getting too much into hardware because you know well if, yeah niche topic. It's, well it's it's a good thing because i don't i don't spend a, a lot of time with the with the nuts and bolts of the thing it seems to have a very organic sound it's almost woody it's uh, uh it's it's organic it's uh um it has a real type of personality to it that is um uh, so distinct and it it's almost sings itself you don't have to do too much and it's kind of an easy instrument to play compared to a lot of the a lot of the copies uh that are made um um i i don't know how to describe it much more than that i mean there's other instruments that have maybe a better low register or a better high register and even even york number two well um the better the two Yorks and the and the lesser of the two. I mean, they're both really good instruments. Um, the uh, the instruments really do work very well. E even even the lesser of the two has a very very singing quality to it. And uh, um, and the story between the two is that uh, there was a hole that developed in the lead pipe. Jacobs gave it to the repair guy at Lion and Healy, which was right nearly across the street from orchestra all the time jake went out had some lunch came back and the and the guy instead of just patching up the hole decided he would he would help jacobs out and he replaced the entire lead pipe with a brand new lead pipe which turned that one the better of the two into the lesser of the two but it's still a really really good instrument and um i don't really want to have very much of anybody screwing around with it until we really have the technology and then and the science to know exactly what to do with the instrument i don't want anybody to you know mess it up as it were um it's kind of like keeping part of pompeii still under uh, under the rubble you know until we get more technology that can Do you ever uh, hear the, the wonderful story that uh, he told us that at one point he'd taken the and i believe it's the second one in for repair and he came back and it was quite a long time trying to get this horn back. Months went by and he finally went back in and said, okay, where's my horn? And he brought it out and the fifth valve was missing. The uh, repairman had sold the fifth valve. I guess he was short of money. So oh, Mr. Jacob, where the valve went and retrieve it. And it had gone out west, I think to Montana or someplace and brought the valve back. He got it back on the horn. But, but oh, crazy thing. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Well, I'm glad he stuck with stuck to his guns with that one. My God. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, uh, apparently, your wife is a, is a tuba player as well. Yeah, Beth is a is a is 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 a tuba player. We're we're seeing our way and in going in different directions now. But she is a tuba player. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Shilke, another Chicago wife, was a tuba player, and Mr. Jacob said he's a very fine tuba player. So it seems to be a Chicago uh, Chicago thing, perhaps. Um, I I didn't know about that about about Reynolds Shilke. I did run into Reynolds Shilke once when the USC <clears throat> marching band uh, came to came to Chicago in 1973. We were playing Notre Dame, and a tuba player buddy of mine, Tony Myatt, and I went into the Shilke uh, uh, Instrument Company, and we um, um, and we saw some tubas there. And Mr. Shilke was there. We picked up the tubas and and um, I remember uh, Tony started to play some notes in the low register and was using the Tommy Johnson embouchure shift, which gets you down into the real, the, the, the nitty gritty meaty low register, which is the only, you know, one of the things that Tommy Johnson could just do spectacularly well. And, uh, um, and, um, and so Tony started to nail these low Fs and low E's and low E flats and, and, and Shilke was, completely disgusted by it because he'd never heard anything like that before. You know, he just, you just never, he never heard Jacobs play that way because Jacobs had a very round, you know, the, the sound was, the sound was fine, but it, it didn't, you know, in the low register, it, it didn't really take off as much as uh, say the uh, Tommy Johnson's low register using, using that embouchure shift and how so many others <clears throat> like, uh, well, Warren Deck in particular, really got the low register going, be kind of discovered the shift on his own. And then Roy Lance, uh, Mike Roy Lance has an incredible low register. So does Pete Link. There's, there's other guys out there uh, um, who just, you know, really nail the low register. But it's, this was something unknown that Reynolds Schilke heard for, maybe for the first time in, in 1973, when the USC marching band came to Came to Chicago. USC, you know, our original trumpet player, Ronnie Rahm, is a graduate of the USC. But I think oh. you would have missed him. I, I, age. You'd be, uh, Ronnie's my age, so you probably would have missed him by anywhere from two to 10 years. I can't figure, maybe 20. At any rate, uh, was he still, uh, did people still talk about Ronnie? He was playing in the LA Philharmonic as an extra at 16 years old. And I think, uh, he was in the brass quintet with Roger Bobo. Oh wow! I, you know, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't know of that. I, 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 I remember at one point when I went in to play the soundtrack to Jurassic Park one lazy afternoon back in the in the spring of 1993, uh, they had guards set up at the at the recording studio at the sound stage because they were going to be showing this brand new technology of the dinosaurs, the animatronics and stuff. And they didn't want anybody in there stealing any ideas. And I think it was Ronnie Rom who showed up, who wanted to visit uh, one of the guys, I don't know if it was Malcolm McNabb or one of those guys who was on the, who was in, in the session. And they had to get some special dispensation from Sandy DeCrescent, the personnel manager, um, the contractor to get to get Ronnie in because you know he, he wasn't a he wasn't a secret service agent you know working for the other studios you know taking notes and being a stealth <laughs> just staring you know stealing dinosaur secrets out of out, out of uh, out of the studio so yeah but I had no idea he was he was Los Angeles based yeah I think his uh, where he used to live where he grew up. I think is now part of the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wheels up. <laughs> Here we go. It's you know yeah, it's one thing that oh sorry, go ahead, Jack. Please. Oh no, I was gonna say it's one thing that some people might not know about you. You mentioned Jurassic Park, and um, I played the the soundtrack to Nightmare Before Christmas earlier this year, and I remember mm -hmm. listening to a particular recording, the one with the movie, and then I came back to Chicago. For a lesson with you and I was like man I really like the tuba playing on this recording and you were like oh that was me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah so I, I, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, like some of your experiences on, on movie soundtracks. There's, there is so little. I mean, I went as a, as, as a sub. It was either Tommy Johnson or Jim Self who, for whom these jobs were mostly made. And when one of them had a conflict or couldn't come in on a particular day, uh, they would go ahead and and they very, very graciously gave the gig to me because I hadn't been around except for just to play that 92, 93 season in, in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. So I got in for one lazy afternoon of Jurassic Park and for uh, I think it was one day of The Fugitive. And, and then there was an entire day with Danny Elfman, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. And unfortunately we couldn't see any of the they didn't show it on the big screen overhead. It was it was right in front of Elfman, so we didn't we didn't know what we were doing uh, or what we were actually accompanying. It's um, it's a whole different way of life. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, you well that'll teach you if you know how to play with a metronome. You know, it's it's not like uh, it's not like one of my trombone colleagues who was at USC who said, "Oh, those those metronomes, they just really throw me off." <laughs> you just <laughs> Yeah. I had a I, you know I had a question for for Chuck because this is one story I heard and I don't know where I heard it Chuck if it was um uh maybe at that breakfast or whatever but uh you know of all the things you guys in the Canadian brass you know you're you're all over you're playing command performances for queens here and kings there and royalty there and you're on the great wall of china and you're you know you're 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 doing the first concerts ever at the antarctic you know you're you're doing all these things that are just amazing but but then you got to go ahead and you got to do the canadian you know got to get the money from the canadian arts council and stuff and so they'll take the five of you guys and they'll send you out to the yukon or you know somewhere out in the in the middle of you know uh bear track uh, you know bear track alberta and you're sitting there in a cold gymnasium everyone's in their parkas shivering and you're and you were saying you were telling me or this is a story i heard that you guys were playing through the first movement of beethoven fifth symphony and it was um and you know you, you and uh, I, you, it was probably you who explained what was going on. It was just the first movement of this very famous piece. And every one of you realized that, you know, this is the first time this crowd had ever heard Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But then it was somewhere in the middle of that first performance, of that performance, that it occurred to you all of a sudden that this was probably going to be the last performance that people in that auditorium, people in that gymnasium were gonna hear it. And all of a sudden, the sense of mission, the sense of purpose, all of a sudden just went exponential. And all of a sudden you were, you were the messengers, you were, you were the sentinels of this piece, the only sentinels of this piece, of one of the greatest pieces of Western music. And so this turned out to be an incredible experience because all of a sudden the mission changed. Do you remember any of this? Can you relate more of that detail? That, yes, and I kind of it's, it's kind of an amalgam of several things. Uh, in fact, that particular piece, the Beethoven, um, we did a large recording of that actually with the New York Philharmonic. We did the Beethoven Fifth Complete and it was for Phillips Records. We were really happy to be with Phillips because <clears throat> they were known as a classical label and we thought that that was, particularly for Europe, uh, would really get a foothold in Europe. And the story that we heard was when the album was complete, they had their meeting about uh, promoting the, how we were gonna promote this album and so forth and handed the recording around. <clears throat> and the consensus was, perhaps we shouldn't put this album out because people will think that Beethoven wrote this for brass. And fortunately, somebody on that panel said, wouldn't it just be nice if people actually knew that Beethoven wrote this piece and that this is looking at it from another vantage point. So fortunately it got released and, but there's a lot of opposition. You have the, the one side of classical music saying anything that you do, if you tamper with anything that perhaps you're, you're devaluing the quality a bit. Whereas our mission, as you said, you're absolutely right. And I appreciate that. There is a mission along with 
the performance and the mission is you're there to make sure that people leave with a, maybe a deeper understanding of certain kind of music and maybe you do that by uh, uh, in our own humble way we kind of took a cue from Shakespeare I think as any performer does is that you have moments of comedy and you have moments of relief and you have moments of tragedy and that a concert can have these kind of ups and downs and that that's really our mission is to leave an audience feeling like they've they've had an experience that was valid and something that they might want to pursue and maybe even want to hear more in our case when we started just getting people to want to hear brass was a challenge sure. now, now it proliferates you guys do a fantastic show every Christmas now. I think you've lined it up with the Midwest Band Clinic that brings in got 16 to 20,000 thousand band directors into Chicago. And uh, you do a large brass ensemble program there. And apparently it's very successful. I've heard nothing but good things about that. Yeah, we, we started it, boy, I don't know how many years ago it was, but it seemed like kind of a natural thing and I was kind of surprised because I came into the orchestra in 1989 that nothing like that had occurred. There was just no, there was no consensus of getting together the, the brass section of the orchestra to do something like that. In fact, whenever there was a, a chance to go ahead and put something together for the brass section um, with something that maybe some of the people were interested in doing, but not everybody. And if you have a ringleader like Herseth, who, Adolf Herseth, who's a um, pretty strong personality, and if he didn't feel like doing it, why, you could pretty much write it off. You know, he just, if he wasn't interested, I remember there was a, uh, a big international brass conference that Harvey Phillips was trying to get together in 1984. And um, Philip Farkas came in to try to uh, came in, took the entire brass section of the CSO out to, out to lunch and explained to them that this would happen right at the beginning of the orchestra's break. And so it would only take up a day or two of the, the downtown break between downtown and when the summer season of Ravinia would start, but it would be a really good thing to do. And uh, people seemed to be in agreement with it, except for one guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that basically stopped it all, you know. And fortunately, there were a few others who managed to come out and, and show themselves at this 1984 brass conference, including Arnold Jacobs. I think uh, Gail Williams came down. So, but, the, but the ensemble as a whole, it did not happen because uh, the number one guy didn't want to do it. Anyway, so the brass, so it, came to pass, you know, when I came into the orchestra that, you know, here's the Midwest Band Clinic and uh, here we have this brass section and, you know, why don't we go ahead and put something together? And I'm not exactly sure the consensus of, of just, you know, it just seemed like a good idea. And so we did it. And, you know, it was basically a show of appetizers, you know, it was like going to a, a Chinese restaurant and ordering nothing but appetizers. So it was all, you know, hits, you know, Crown Imperial and Pines of Rome and just one blockbuster after another. And, the, and, and management was really, really skeptical that this was going to go over. And they said, you know, if this thing flops, you guys are going to pay for it. You know, we're just, we're just, you know, you, you can't do stuff like this. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. We know about this reputation of the, of the brass section, but you know, you, you just can't sell stuff like this. It, it, it just won't work. And, I, and our director of marketing at the time was just, you know, threatening and was threatening us with all types of stuff. And I remember after this incredible um, uh, show of, I mean, the place, the, the concert sold out in no time and people were all, were all for it. I mean, you know, they were just all, the vector was in the same direction. They were all for the, this big, this big concert. And one of our guys got up in front and made, made an announcement and said, I'm wondering if you guys, if you really appreciate what we've tried to do here, could you, could you right now, could you cheer loud enough that they can hear you up on the seventh floor and uh, let them know that this is, that this concert actually went over pretty well. And of course the place exploded. So, and we've been doing it most every year since then. 
uh, Michael Mulcahy is, we've, we've elected him as being kind of the, uh, uh, the organizer for this thing because we have to have a balanced program of this and that and some new pieces and some old music and uh, pieces with legacy. And, um, and that's what we went, we've done selections from Turandot, uh, opera we, we've done you know some of the blockbuster arrangements of joe crinus and some other things and we've tried to do that and it's been mostly mostly every year since then and it's something that people really people really uh, look forward to we certainly look forward to it in the brass section for the most part i think that's the big change in the uh, audience perception of brass and I know that uh, many people were tapping away at this since, I don't know, maybe the 40s, 50s, 60s, of uh, uh, bringing music that can be shared. The musicians have to love it, or you're gonna have a problem. And the audience has to share that love, and then you've got something really valid. And I think what you're talking about is casting around for the right repertoire and the right effect. That's, uh, I think, was the big change uh, from people that preceded us where it was the great artist and you either appreciated it or you didn't know enough about music. And it changed to the performer actually being in charge of creating that connection. And it sounds like that's exactly what you guys in Chicago are doing the same thing. You have an audience, you're going to be meeting an audience. How do we affect this audience in the way we would like to see that shared experience? Yeah. Well, when people had people as hobbyists, would take up the violin or take up the cello, take up their own amount of entertainment because they didn't have radio, because they didn't have TV. Then when you have, or, or singing, then when you have um, a string quartet that's on tour, back say at the turn of the last century, uh, 18th, uh, the, 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 the 19th century, when they would come to town, these people who are amateur musicians, amateur uh, violinists and stuff, they would show up to these concerts because the, they could appreciate what this professional violinist in front of them was doing. They could appreciate a Caruso singing because no matter how good a voice a person had who was trying to sing and was an amateur, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be as good as Caruso. And when you have uh, an audience of brass players, which I would imagine maybe those people who show up to our concerts at, at our brass concert, they know what it is. They know how hard it is to play after playing for 45 minutes to play a really soft entrance on a trumpet, or you have a, you know, a, a, a really quick line that the trombone player has to play. They can appreciate that. It's not a matter of simply someone who's, you know, who's heard some recordings and 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 you know and they say wow that, that that sounds almost as good as a canadian brass you know <laughs> so <laughs> you know it, but, but you have but you have folks who actually are are amateurs they are literally lovers of the art amateur you know they they they're, they're lovers of it and they're fans and they want to hear it so uh, there's a I, nice comment uh, we just got a nice comment from scott mccoriak said uh, his wife and he loved the CSO December concert. So there you go. It's yeah, amazing. well, that's great. Here's another question. This is an important one because uh, you have become well known amongst the uh, uh, students and the teachers, teachers uh, point people in this direction. You uh, run a seminar every year and um, Wes Craigsman is wondering, is the Pokorny seminar still happening this year or is it uh, being impacted of course by COVID-19? We got the word last week from uh, Dr. Andrew Glendening, who is basically my point man for this organ uh, for, for the Picorni seminar, that it will not happen. Uh, it was scheduled to be out at Northern Illinois Uni University at DeKalb, Illinois. That's a change of location. It's been out at the University of Redlands for about 12 years or so, 12 or 13 years. And... Um, um, that's where Andrew was the Dean of the School of Music there. And it's a place where I spent two years of my college time out there in Redlands, California. Um, 
it started off just being a, a, a tuba thing, and then we added bass trombone. Then we had then we had a whole the whole array of, of trombone players out there. Um, but uh, he changed jobs. He so now he's at Northern Illinois University at uh, DeKalb, uh, and uh, and we just found out it was scheduled to go from I believe June fourteenth for a week, uh, and so. Uh, Everything seemed to be set, except that um, um, they have a problem with trying to get uh, the janitorial staff working out there. And that seems to be the, an unforeseen thing that was going to finally, finally put an end to it. So there's a lot of things. I mean, the Hamamatsu Wind Academy is canceled for this year. Um, will you take it, uh, will you take it onto the internet? Will you do your, uh, your seminar? I don't think so, uh, because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, ensemble playing and a lot of teamwork issues, which need to get, which need to happen. I mean, that's a that's a, of course a very big aspect of playing an ensemble. I do intend to get together with those uh, who signed up for the tuba class and. Um, uh, I'm going to get together with those guys and have a have a private Zoom thing because they went ahead and they signed up for it and to have a have a get together because of their. But we had a uh, we have quite a we had quite an array of people set up and we expect to have the same thing. We had Chris Olka from the Cincinnati Symphony lined up, Derek Fenstermacher. Uh, want to have him along? Um, uh, we have. Uh, a great bass trombone faculty uh, with, with with Randy Hawes, uh, um, Jeremy Wilson from from uh, from uh, Vanderbilt, and of course Andrew Glendening, and um, had uh, uh, David Bender and 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 Mulcahy. We we had, we had some good people lined up and hopefully we'll get them lined up sometime next year when schedules start to calm down again so how much of your concentration uh, would revolve around chamber music um not enough <laughs> uh, uh, it should involve more um I think uh, when it comes along to uh, some things like tuba ensemble and that, I think that's probably good for some of the, especially uh, intonation issues and that, especially when we're when we're so comfortable with just sitting on the on the root of the chord a lot of times. But uh, but as far as ensemble is concerned, give and take, espressivo, those types of things, uh, there has to be. Uh, more of that and i would say that's probably one thing that i'm lacking in my teaching is is trying to get more and more of the ensemble things happening um what is a typical what is a typical student looking to get from you what are they looking to gain are they all pointed in i hope to get that one two good job that comes open in six years or is it more well, uh, many of them will come to me uh, with um, with solo music, and I have no problem going through solo music, and um, because I I really do, especially like solo music. I especially like uh, like uh, playing transcriptions of vocal music, uh, and that if it's in if it's good solo music, I really like to put a lot of a lot of effort into that. Where I try to remind students is that my expertise, at least where I spend most of my time is in the orchestral excerpts and trying to get those things to happen. And how do you get, how do you get yourself to captivate an, uh, an audition committee when they're listening to you? And uh, I find surprisingly a lot of them a lot of the students will miss so much of the small stuff. They might get the notes and that, but if they're missing, if they're going through Sensa Maya, say by Brev Weltis, and if they're hitting all the notes, that's fine. If they're missing staccatos, if they're missing marcatos, if they're missing accents, if they're missing 
a wide range of dynamics that go all the way from pianissimo all the way up to fortissimo. If they're if they're missing that, if they miss where the apex of of the the high point of the phrase, if, if they're missing where that's that, that is, then they're missing so much of the stuff that's that's right there embedded in the music, and they've got to they've got to show all of these different aspects just as much as if they're playing American in Paris, uh, if, if they're if they're trying to play it with a metronome, they can, they, they can kiss that excerpt right off. They might as well just move right along. On the other hand, if it, if it, if they're playing Meistersinger, if they're not sticking with the metronome, then they can that they can write that one off because because there's a different a whole other set of parameters. If they're if they're playing the beginning of Meistersinger, if they start to if, if they're playing a tenuto, fine. But if they start, if they start off the, the letter J and if they aren't marcato from the very first second space C, that, no. Well, this is, this is what I've heard from anybody that's uh, been next to you and studied with you and so forth is that it, it's a musical approach. It's not, a how to, it's not a how to play the horn, it's how to use the horn to play music. Or how to get that song out of your head that Jacob used to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. It's, that's and that's yeah, you walk on you walk on stage with two uh, with two instruments, one in your hand and one in your head. And and that one in your head be really better be educated to what what you really want it to sound like, which is why this pandemic is so incredibly great all this time that people have it's unbelievable what's the biggest thing we have problem with ourselves and when we're trying to convince our students to do it's listening to music nobody has enough time to listen we're always putting the music out we're always playing this stuff when do we actually have a chance to sit down and actually listen to a piece of music and really learn it when's the last time you actually listened to nielsen third symphony When's the last time you actually listened to some Schubert songs with with the words in front of you, with the with the definitions, you know, the, the the translations, so you know what notes can correspond to what to what words and what they're trying to go across. Who's, I'm a real fan of Gerald Finzi. I think Gerald Finzi is one of the most incredible composers. No one's ever heard of him. You know, he's he's a, he was a contemporary of Von Lamps, but he's he's putting all this music by. Thomas Hardy, which is one of the great one of the great uh, writers of English literature, these these poems that are and and things and 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 prose that are just so wrenching, and 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 Finzi put this stuff to music, and it's it's you you can you can really learn what espressivo is, and. Uh, and uh, listening to Puccini arias, I mean, if, if if you aren't just a bubbling mass of tears by the end of some of these things, uh, because of how you can listen to these things and relate them to common, to common, uh, common occurrences that have occurred in our lives, um, you, you're kind of missing the point. So, I'm okay. I I, I forgot what the original question was. I just went off into hyperspace there, but. Um, you know, in the, in the university circuit, there's a moment when uh, students get to evaluate their teacher and they get to write it down. And I think it's quite secret and private and they send all these comments and the teacher sees, oh, I'm missing the mark here or I'm really doing great there. But we have a great opportunity right now. Um, Jean, right in front of you is someone that's studying with you. Jarrett, tell us about Jean's. Yeah, well, yeah, that was like, I've sort of been gleaning a lot from this, uh, from the questions that Chuck's been asking me then. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I've, I've picked up from your teaching is just that you sort of embody this very humble musician to me. And you're always, you sort of embody this growth mindset. It's sort of like a buzzword that I've been hearing about a lot lately is that when you, um, the minute that you stop learning is, you know, uh, you, you might as well just, you know, stop playing music. And I think you're always someone who is willing to, learn uh, and keep learning. And I just, I don't know uh, where did you get that sort of like sense of humility from and how do you apply it to, it's a very broad question, but where did you get the sense of humility 
and how do you apply it to um, your music and your life? And I, I just want to hear you talk a little bit about that. Well, um, the humility, I'm, I'm not sure about. It's probably something that I um, grew up with in, in, in some ways. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up in a trailer park uh, <laughs> in Southern California. Um, it, um, I had some challenges growing up with mom and dad. It was, it was, not, it was not the easiest type of thing to do. Um, but, uh, I was, uh, um, I would say that, um, there was, uh, I, I think being very, very impressed by my early studying with, with Jeff Reynolds and kind of exposure around, um, uh, Bobo and Tommy Johnson, they were very different type of personalities and that, and I think, I think, um, I, I distinctly remember one thing that happened and I don't know if it has that much to do with, with humility, but I remember one of my very earliest experiences when I first became a professional playing in the Israel Philharmonic, I had a chamber music project that I was asked to play in and I was going to play, um, the Hindemith, Hindemith Sonata. And so, I was working with this pianist, Yonatan Zak, who is part of the Israel Piano Trio. And, um, and I was playing the hand, Hindemith. Well, I, like I told you before, I mean, it was Roger Bobo. He was, you know, the beginning, the middle, the end, the top, the bottom, you know, that was it. You know, you just, you just aim for that and you don't have to even aim for anything else. You don't even have to hear of anybody else. It was just Roger, you know, just, just, just do it like Roger. And, and I was in the middle of this rehearsal with Fiona Tanzak uh, playing the Hindemith Sonata. And he stops in the middle of it while I was playing. And he said, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, the typical Israeli, you know, they just, you know, the, it just, you know, they, the, you know, it, I don't know if they even have the word tact in their, in their, in the vocabulary. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, 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 I loved living there and I love and I love the people there. But you know, he's like, what are you doing? You're, you're just playing, you're, you're just copying somebody. I, I can tell. It's not one original idea coming out of your head. <laughs> it's like, well, is that the way you really feel, or are you just trying to couch it in nice terms? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he, no, he says, you have to come up with your own idea. This, this is your piece now. It's not, it's not this, 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 what, what was his name? Boski, Boski, what, Bo, 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 no, 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 it's not, no, it's not his piece anymore. It's yours. It's your piece. You got to take over. This, this, this is your piece. And so that kind of, I mean, he, he basically slapped me across the room, you know, with this and, so then I realized, okay, well, I got to come up with my, with my own ideas here. And, and of course, being in that orchestra, I mean, where there's so much, so much emotion in that, in the Israel Philharmonic, you, you really learned how, how, what Espressivo is all about. So, so I don't know about, I, 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 I'm still not answering your question regarding humility, except that maybe that's just, um, I, 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 I can find that I can, I know the times when I haven't been uh, that way and I regret them. I regret, I regret them in a bad way, but I, I well, just, it's, it's something really, really important. You just mentioned it. We're, we're going to be running out of time and it's important. You just included the word slap. You said you were slap, slap. That reminded me. Um, <laughs> Don't you have some affinity for a uh, a comedy group that uh, I think you're an expert? <laughs> Not as much as some, but I am a victim of circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the boys, uh, the Three Stooges, they're they're something else. I. Uh, yeah, whenever I well, it's not whenever I go out to L.A., but I I I do pay homage at the at the grave sites at the Home of Peace Cemetery there at the 710 and the Olympic Boulevard. Uh, that's where um, that's where Curly is, and there's usually uh, 
you usually find some spoons there because he was always playing the spoons, you know, and and people write out in uh, in in with with uh, with, with with pennies and that and uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, I I the Three Stooges are are fine. I you right, know, right. So, are there um, um, similar personalities you work with every day in the orchestra? <laughs> Uh, there's, uh, there are morons, but not as good as Curly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, <laughs> I remember a couple times, you know, doing a nyuk, 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 you know, with Schulte and he's looking around, well, what, what is that noise? You know, <laughs> apparently he didn't find out what it was. <laughs> No, no, he's, you know, he's, and, or, or, you know, Baron Boehm's, Baron Boehm's wife said, uh, you know, when she sees my suspenders, you know, and she says, oh, are those the Marx Brothers? And I'm, oh, sweetheart, you got to get with the program here. <laughs> these are the three stooges, you know? I mean, people know these names of these guys more than they, they can name more of the three stooges than they can the, the you know the justices on the supreme court of the united states you know <laughs> there's always one uh, there was always one three stooges line that i thought was perfect for tuba players and could be used continually and that is getting somebody to help you i, I need somebody to pick up this instrument and you say well why well i have a week back <laughs> and you know where that goes right so, <laughs> When did that start? <laughs> yeah. Oh, about a week back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There are one-liners where I was cute. Oh. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and spending this time with us. And I know that you must be getting dozens and dozens of requests for this very kind of meeting. I know people are very eager to hear what you have to say. And you've made a tremendous impact on the tuba world. And everybody has forgiven you for uh, monopolizing all the great orchestras. It was long enough ago. Uh, I'll, I'll be out of here soon, you know. I mean, uh, you can't go on forever. The tsunami in the rearview mirror is catching up, no matter how much. Don't say that. Don't say that. No, no. <laughs> oh. No, we need you. We need you. We need you. <laughs> is it the tall poppy syndrome, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going to be great. Jared, final words? No, I mean, I just, uh, I, I feel really blessed to be able to to interact with you on such a regular basis and just going to see the orchestra um, played so regularly and, and being able to study with you so regularly is, is something that I, you know, constantly remind myself that it's not going to be forever, but that I'm very thankful for both your, you know, your presence in my life, both as a, as a friend, a mentor and uh, as a musician. So thank you so much for, well, you know, uh, being here. You guys have been uh, wonderful Chuck for so many years and so many just completely changing the landscape for for where we're at and uh, and uh, for Jared all of your recent contributions being a finalist in the Tchaikovsky competition and uh, being someone who does more than the tuba who goes ahead and, and does all this stuff on the mental work and that um, it's great to have great human beings a great musician and then you happen, and then it happens to play the tuba as well. I mean, you know, in that order, in that order. So, I, I tip my hat to both you guys, really. Just, Thank so yeah. Thank you so much for that, and it's really been really been fun to have you here. Uh, so uh, we'll be here next week, uh, doing this again. Jarrett, thank you, and Gene, it was very generous of you to spend this time with us. I'm glad we could do this. What a kick! Beautiful. <laughs> okay. So. So goodbye to everyone and uh, see you soon.